Welcome to Stormworks. I have a new audio set up and I figured I should make a low risk video to test it out. So we're gonna learn how to make nuclear reactors in Stormworks. The new release, the Steam release, includes nuclear and coal. And it seems like some people are having a hard time with the nuclear reactor. It's, uh, it's not very challenging once you know the secrets. So I'll teach you the secrets. As for my review of this update, I don't like it. And I don't like it because it doesn't interact with the rest of the game. It's off in its own little corner, doing its own little thing, and doesn't interact at all with any of the physics from the rest of the game, which, uh, which means there is a best way to do things, and I'm going to teach it to you. Now, in reality, these fuel rods here would be what cause the reaction, right? This would be enough to cause a reaction, because the whole point is that when these fuel rods break down, that radiation causes nearby neighbors to also break down and emit their own radiation. And that's what makes a collection of fuel rods go critical and start to heat up. It's entirely proximity based. Obviously, there are some factors like if you're using, uh, you know, some kind of lead container or between them or something. But in general, it's entirely about the density of the fuel rods. And that's not true in this game at all. The fuel rods are entirely passive. They're 100% safe. They only react when they are inserted into a nuclear fuel assembly. That's this bad boy. Once they're inserted, they begin to behave like fuel rods, but they stop behaving like fuel rods the instant you eject them, even if you don't move them. That means that nuclear fuel assemblies are super safe in this game. Just eject them when you when you don't uh, when you want to stop the reaction. It's it's really much safer than you might think. You feel free to play around. In order to insert the fuel rods, we need to actually physically insert them. So we're going to add in a, uh, a rail, and then we're going to put the fuel rod on the rail. And then we're going to physically drag the rail into the fuel rod. Or, you know, into the containment, into the fuel assembly. <laughs> so the fuel rod is now in the fuel assembly, and we are technically reacting, but this is not a critical reaction. This is a subcritical reaction because it has no neighbors, so the radiation it's giving off is not causing any other radiation to get you know, emitted. In order to cause a more critical reaction, we're going to have to give it some neighbors. So to do that, we can just copy it. Boop. And copy this too. Boop. Pow. So now the radiation from the middle rod will affect the rods on the sides and vice versa, which means that the middle rod will go up in temperature. All three of them will go up in temperature, but the middle rod is going to be the hottest because it's got two neighbors. And we can see that by simply looking at it, see? But this is still a subcritical reaction. Uh, and that means that we, are, we don't have enough uh, radiation swapping to actually cause these to get super hot. They're going to like hover at maybe 40 degrees. And that's just not hot enough for, for our needs. We need to be at least able to boil water. So um, we're going to need more of them. And by uh, simply creating more, we can do that. So just like we can uh, with, with the, the demo, the demo uh, reaction, demo reactor that the game gives you, uses this setup. It's a 3x3 three three grid. And this, of course, creates a pretty strong reaction because uh, the center element is receiving radiation from its four neighbors, and its four neighbors are receiving radiation uh, from, from the edges. Uh, and that means that we're getting a lot of radiation swapping, and all of these are going to get super hot super fast. Uh, the downside of this is that it does have uh, control issues, which we'll talk about. But... Um, we're going to see some runaway reaction. It's going to go critical, and if we, you know, kind of let it, it's going to eventually go super critical, and we are going to get irradiated and die. So this is now at 85 degrees, and it's on the outside. Now it's boiling, and it's on the outside. The one in the middle is much, much hotter. And uh, you can see we've got a heat symbol in the corner. We're going to have the radiation symbol any second here. There it is. And you can see it was turning red. I didn't give it quite enough time because uh, I didn't want to die. That level of heat is not significant in the game. You can easily run at 10 times that. Um, but we don't have any, any protection. There's no shielding between us and the reactor. So we were taking direct radiation, and that's obviously not ideal. But the other thing to keep in mind is that that setup would, in fact, go supercritical. 
the center rod was already going to be at like 500 or so degrees and it would just go up and up and up and up and up and eventually you'd have a nice little nuclear meltdown and you generally don't want that. What you want is the ability to control this reaction. Now you could control it by ejecting fuel rods but that would stop the reaction. We want to mitigate it. We want to slow it down but we don't want to stop it. That is of course where the last piece of the puzzle comes in. The control rods. Here they are. These control rods take in a value between 0 and 1, which tells them how much to inhibit their neighbors. So if we put the control rods all along the sides like this, oop, not like that. Come on. In theory, if we insert these control rods, they will stop these outer three uh, on each side the outer six from reacting and it would just be the inner three and that's not enough as I said three in a row is subcritical so in theory this would work but there's an error here a glitch you see I have foolishly put these control rods on the same baseline as these center rods because that would make sense no, no unfortunately you need the control rods to line up like this and the way to remember that is quite simple it's these it's these these lines here, these welded, um, you, know, you know, hexagonal stitching elements. They need to line up. Now we can, in fact, cause this reaction to stop. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to add in a little function block. The hottest rod is always going to be the one on the inside, the innermost element here. There it is. And then we'll use that to drive the control rod insertion and we'll just give it a nice reserved number x divided by 300 so that center rod is not inside I forgot to actually put it in give me a second here grab it notice that the radiation doesn't fade once you're irradiated it takes a while for you to recover it's fine we're not we're not worried so this center rod is going to get real hot, and it's going to get real hot slowly. Last time it got real hot very, very fast because we didn't have any control rods. But you can see that we're moving these control rods, and that means that we are mitigating this reaction. The outer six fuel assemblies here are being told not to react, not to count as fuel assemblies. And that means that we are going to get a lot less heat from them, and the whole thing is going to come under our control much, much faster. You can see that it's just kind of trundling along. 200 degrees centigrade, pretty straightforward Celsius. And it should max out at around 300, because that's what we told it to do. Uh, yeah, pretty basic stuff, no big deal. It's completely under control. Now you might think that you're in trouble because the control rods are now pretty close to maxed out, but the temperature is still going up. It's because there's a lot of, of um, wash. There's a lot of inertia in these, so you have to make sure to look ahead. But here you can see that it's, uh, it's kind of stopped at around no, 280, going to go down to maybe 275 or 260. And that's going to be a nice way to get that to be at a temperature we want it to be at. We don't have to uh, let it go out of control. We don't have to do anything strange or obnoxious. We can just use that one little basic setup to uh, get everything to work fine. Now we are sitting here 100% exposed to these controls, or to these uh, to these reactions. We are catching radiation. If it was any hotter, we would definitely be getting sick from it. But it's at a nice stayed 250 which is about one third of what i like to run these at so you know let's talk a little bit about containing them inside of you know, some kind of watery grave it's pretty easy to create a water container for your reactor you just box it in now in this case it's not going to work out for us very well because i have to physically push the uh the rail in so we're going to have to replace that with an automatic rail just go ahead and put in a little battery and put in a little number make that number one and then we'll connect that number to the rail then connect that power to the rail and now it's all automated and now it's inside of a box 
So if we wanted to, we could then simply add in a fluid spawner to fill that box with whatever we want. I recommend water. Whatever's in here is going to do a really great job at sucking up the radiation, so we're not going to get irradiated nearly as fast. We can also put a fluid meter in here as well. Now the reason you're going to want a fluid meter is because there is a glitch, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But you're going to generally want to check that fluid meter and make sure you've actually got a chamber. Um, because sometimes you'll find that your reaction chamber stopped existing. Fun with glitches, right? Now that it's con completely contained, uh, it's still going to behave the exact same way, but it's actually heating water. And we could take that water and pump it into a boiler to boil, to get some steam. And that's what we're going to do. That's how a reactor works. So I'm going to go ahead and show you a fully functional reactor room now. That would be this one. Just strip off some of these surfaces for us. So here is our reactor, and you can see that it is a little bit smaller than the one that I just showed you. Uh, the way that this one works is, I'll show you, it's um, it's a 2x3 instead of a 3x3. Three three. And the reactor control rods go here and here. Well, technically, they're a couple of blocks above that, but you get the idea, right? Now, this is a much more effective and efficient control system. It's a slower reactor. It doesn't get hot as fast, but it's much lighter, and it's also a lot easier to manipulate. The others, the other, the 3x3 three three one, you needed six control rods, and even at 100%, it would barely hold the reactor down. But this, you only need two control rods, and it'll hold the reactor down at 30%. So it's super safe and super easy, and that's the layout we're using inside of this tablet that we've got here. We've also got a bunch of, uh, of connectors, water connectors, on the sides. And that's just so that we can export that water, that hot water, to whoever needs it. But you might have noticed that that object is its own separate object. So before the things we had as a separate object were the reactor rods, the fuel rods, and you can see they are a separate object as well. But here we can see the reactor and the fuel rods are both separate objects. What's up with that? Well, the reason you do that is because the reactor chamber is, pr is prone to calculating incorrectly. So if you put the reactor chamber inside of another chamber, like say inside of a ship, you're very likely to end up with the reactor thinking that the entire engine room is inside the reactor. Or that there just is no containment at all. And that will obviously make it really, really hard to pump water out of the reactor to anywhere. So it's not recommended. But if you make your device a separate object like this, then it will calculate its chambers as a separate object, and you can just rely on that. That's why it is a separate object, technically speaking, even though it can't be moved. Now that does mean you're going to have a hard time getting water out of it. In this case, I've chose to use the, uh, the water uh, ropes rather than trying to go through the water um, linear track fluid area, because area, I wanted a lot of different connectors and uh, I needed more than just one or two. So if we look at this, here's our reactor, and you can see it's doing its own thing, slowly heating up, and you can see that we've connected the hoses over to the boiler intake. So it's the same basic setup, it just looks a little bit snazzier, and we've got two boilers, uh, and it's pretty basic, right? That's how you integrate a nuclear reaction chamber into your boiler sequence. You just get the water out of the nuclear reactor. But you're going to have to have the nuclear reactor be its own thing for the aforementioned reason of that, that calculation bug. So that's why we've got this uh, containment breach warning and this chamber water set up so that you can tell right away if something has gone wrong and you've accidentally assembled it in a way that it doesn't like. Now this won't actually work because it requires water. Um, but we'll go ahead and discuss it, and then we'll put it in the water, and you'll see how it works. So this little tablet is our nuclear reactor. It outputs super hot water out to these boilers. That's done here, into the sides of the boilers. 
Now the boiler also takes in cold water from this blue tank, but not directly. There is a pump. See this? So what's happening here is that we are controlling the amount of cold water that's going into the boiler to be converted into steam. We're using this pump to make sure that only as much water as we want gets in. Now the reason for that is because these boilers have a maximum temperature, uh, or a maximum pressure rather. So if we allow these boilers to take in as much water as they want, they're going to end up creating too much steam and exploding. The pressure, which is the fourth value down here, the pressure maxes out at 10. Once it reaches 10, the boiler explodes. So that's why we have to keep the amount of steam under control. Lots of people have, have posited, you know, things like, oh, if you want to keep the steam under control, you should have a steam valve or whatever. But the easiest way to do it is to just not give the boiler any more water. If there's no more water to turn into steam, then the steam is constant. It's not going to go up at all. This way is the easiest way to control the pressure, and it means that it doesn't matter how hot the boiler is. Even if the boiler is floating around at like 600 degrees, it's not going to overheat and explode because there's no more water to turn into steam until we tell it to do so. I'll let you see that happen here. We've just turned on the pumps here, and we are just starting to get some hot water down into the steam boiler. Now this reactor behind me, this one here, is a little bit slower than the one we saw just because there aren't as many reaction rods clustered together. But since it's such an easy job to control it, I, I think that it's worth the, you know, worth the slowdown. 65. Once that temperature reaches 100, it'll begin to produce steam. You can hear the control rods, and now you can hear the turbines. So our pressure is going up. It's at three now. It's going to go up to four, and then it's going to hesitate. And you can see how we're injecting pulses of fluid. And once we hit 9.5, we'll stop injecting pulses of fluid. So basically, we've got some logic that says, uh, is there any fluid in the steam boiler? Don't add more fluid if there's fluid. Are we at less than 9.5 pressure? add more fluid if there if we are so it's just those two those two constraints uh, mean that we are always going to hover at 9.5 which is as much as we can safely do and you can see that we're not seeing that fluid hang around if you look down at the bottom it says water in and that does pulse up from time to time but it doesn't actually show up as fluid that's because this is a super high temperature boiler it boils away faster than it can show up now, that is going to make it a really, really powerful steam producer, and it can. that's why there are six steam turbines attached to each of these boilers. Uh, and that's simply because these super high temperature boilers can feed six steam turbines. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, if you're using a lower temperature, like with coal, you might have to go more one-to-one -one or something similar, you have to adjust it. But because these are so high temperature, they can easily feed six boilers, or six turbines. Let's put it in the water, and we'll talk about how it works when it actually works. Because this needs to be water-cooled, in our case. We'll just grab the intact one from history here. So now that it's in a box and in the water, we'll have a fully functional setup. Here we are. So the water from the reactor goes into the boilers and then the steam from the boilers goes along these orange pipes and that goes into the turbines the turbines export that steam once they're done with it through these yellow pipes that used up steam goes into these steam condensers and then turns back into water which goes right back into that blue water tank see this is a very easy cycle. It's how everybody recommends you do it. It's the only way you can do it because there's no easy source of fresh water. So you've got to reuse it. You've got to recondense it or you will run out of water on the quick, right? So um, this is the basic setup and it's super basic, super straightforward, super easy uh, once you know how. And until you know how, it's a really annoying mess. <laughs> and that's... Um, that's a reactor room. And you might be wondering, does this actually put out enough power to make it worth it? Eh, not really. I mean, with me, I like the glitch engines, and I can put out 50 or 60 times as much power in something smaller than even one of these condensers. 
Um, but if you're not into cheating and you don't like to actually have fuel problems, this is 100% free energy. Uh, you're not going to run out of fuel. You're not going to run out of fluid. You're just going to be able to rely on it forever. These steam turbines seem to max out at about 2 liters a second of steam. I've tried to take it above that limit, couldn't figure out how, couldn't find any secrets on that. Uh, let me know if you know of a way to take it above 2 liters per second of steam. But that's why there are 6 of them. Uh, the, the object here, the steam boiler here, can produce enough steam to split between these 6, give them about 1.5 each. Uh, and that's because the boiler has a maximum steam throughput. You can see down at the bottom how it's kind of hovering around 9 liters a second. I, I think that that's as good as it's ever going to be. I don't think it can ever produce more steam than that, faster than that, no matter how high the temperature is. But, uh, yeah. We can change the target heat, we can do some other stuff. Um, we're gonna actually just shut it down. Ah! Got a little pulse of radiation there for a second. So now that it's been detached, it is uh, not going to produce any more heat, but we are getting just a little bit of radiation. Yeah, because we stood right next to those control rods. It's fine. Uh, eventually, this place will become irradiated because that water will become irradiated. The, the water in here, not the water in here. But it should be off in the corner of your ship and you shouldn't have any problems. And you can use these hoses to attach it to external pumps if you ever want to cycle that water out. But, um, yeah, it's just kind of to show you how it all goes. That's that. Hope this was helpful, and I hope you could hear me. Bye.